Yeah, I'm, I'm with Starbucks now. I joined there in September of last year, so it's been about 10 months, and that's uh, 10 months of real work instead of uh, working for a vendor and you know going out and doing almost kind of salesy things. So this is really exciting for me. I'm actually delivering software again. And I want to talk about some of the things I've learned having left Lightbend and TypeSafe and what we're doing at Starbucks to try and solve real problems and how we're doing that. But before I do, I want to introduce a couple people, if that's OK. First of all, sitting over here is Yvonne Young. She is the director of a group that is building our entire customer platform using Scala, using Akka, using Cassandra. And she's getting help from people like Adam Rosine, who is sitting over here somewhere, I think. There's Adam. Uh, Adam's from Underscore. Um, you might have heard of Underscore from like um, Shapeless and Miles Sabin and stuff like that. So uh, Adam is uh, one of their consultants. Um, also on my team sitting to her right, that's uh, Chang Oh. Uh, down here is Poonam Thawani. And I know Jani is right here. And Jason. So if you're interested in talking to us about positions at Starbucks, we're the people you want to reach out to. We'll be at a booth downstairs. It's not very well marked. We didn't bring a flag or anything like that, but there is swag and stuff like that. So uh, you're certainly welcome to join us. Uh, before I start, is it okay if I switch my monitor real quickly? Because I am mirroring and I won't be able to see my notes. So that's not a good thing. Uh, Your displays. Okay. Much better. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm Jamie Allen. I'm the Director of Engineering of uh, the Unified Commerce Platform at Starbucks. And what that means is that we are completely rebuilding the way we handle rewards and the mobile order and pay. So if anybody has ever gone to a Starbucks here in Canada or in the US and had a certain experience where you were able to um, you know, accumulate rewards and stars and points and stuff like that, or be able to order on your phone and then show up and pick up the coffee. But then you go to a different Starbucks and you get a completely different experience where you can't do any of that. That's a problem for us because you don't care who owns that Starbucks. All you care about is that you know, you went to a Starbucks and you were trying to do the thing you wanted to do, like reward points, you wanted to redeem it and get a free drink. You couldn't do it because you were in an airport. And that's not fun for anybody. So we're trying to solve problems like that by completely rebuilding our rewards and mobile order and pay platforms. And Yvonne, she's building the whole customer world, right? So this is a very big and important initiative for Starbucks, probably the largest inside the company from a technological perspective. As a company, we've never really been a big software shop. So we're taking our developers and bringing them into a completely different world. And you know, they showed up. They didn't have any experience with Scala or Akka. They may have been .NET developers, or maybe they were Java. But they had no experience with the ways and approaches that we were bringing to the table. No SQL, distributed systems, domain-driven design. All of this was completely new and foreign. So we had to overcome a lot of early challenges. And we have, so that's a, that's a good thing. We're actually going into production with our first system in two months. So I'm really excited, yay. Um, yeah, so if you want to find out about positions that we have before I get started, uh, definitely please check out our websites, careers at starbucks.com. Um, for my team, you'll find us under anything listed as microservices. Uh, microservices engineers, senior engineers, principal, technical managers. Our technical managers code. They do not get to not code. They have to be developers themselves, get their hands dirty. I myself get my hands dirty, not very often. But I do sit there and play with some data migration when I can. So um, that's because I love it. And I want people on my team who love to code. Now, one thing about Starbucks is we do have a rule that you have to be a good person. You cannot be rude or terrible to other people. You have to have empathy. You must be kind. And so if you don't, then we serve you de decaf. I thought that was funny, but nobody laughed. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> anyway, let me get started on the actual content of my talk. Um, when you work for a vendor like TypeSafe and Lightbend, it's very easy to lose sight of what it is customers are actually trying to do. Because you're out there trying to get them to adopt your technologies. And even though I felt like we had the right kind of solutions to help people at Lightbend uh, through Akka and Play Framework and Scala, I was a real believer, and I still am, I don't understand the business problems that people are actually trying to solve. And that's really 
that's a big deal. You walk in there, you're trying to help people, but you don't understand their business. And there's no way you can in a short sales meeting or something like that. And Jonas runs around, and I love him. He's a wonderful person. But he's saying, without resilience, nothing else matters. And I want to disagree with that. That is not true. Nothing matters more than delivering business value. Nothing. You don't have a project unless you have somebody to fund it. And you're not going to have somebody funding it unless this is an initiative that actually meets some sort of strategic goal of the business. So when we talk about resilience, it's really a secondary concern. It's not number one. You have to be delivering business value. And you know what? We work in retail at Starbucks and quarter to quarter, things change. Just because we had some sort of quarter that wasn't so great or maybe we had a great quarter, all of a sudden we're like, all right, let's go do this. Not so great quarter, suddenly everybody's like, well, when do we get that thing? And we need it right now because we need to attack this one business opportunity that we have. And so at Starbucks, there's a lot of pressure on us to get this out quickly. And so our stakeholders are definitely really interested on when we're going to deliver this new rewards and mobile order and pay platform. They want it now. There's no, hey, give it to us in 2019 or something like that. But we have realities too. We can't just throw this in the oven and say it's done in 20 minutes. We've got to build it and we've got to make sure it works and we've got to go through all the security cycles. So it's a it's a long process to get there, but we have to deliver business value. That's more important than anything that you know, resilience has to do with. Yeah, once you have something delivering business value, it's great if it works. That would be awesome. But first, you have to actually build that business value. Now, how are we going to do something like this whenever we have teams that don't know our technologies or approaches? And this is the hardest problem I've seen. I have been a Scala developer since 2008, so nine years now. I have been an actor developer as much time. And believe it or not, the other keynote is coming, Duncan DeVore. Him and I learned together facing each other across a table in a team room in 2008. We were learning underneath Michael Pilquist, who's the creator of Simulacrum and one of the biggest contributors to FS2, the functional streams library that uh, replaced Scala Z streams. Um, he was the person who said, we have to learn Scala. And so we did, and we did really, really bad code for a long time. It took a while for us to actually start writing code that we weren't embarrassed by. Maybe six months, because there was no training. There weren't training classes to take. You know, we had Martin Odersky's book, but it was really thick. You know, <laughs> that was it. That was all of the uh, resources we had available to us. And we had to figure out how to do all this work. And then certain realities start to rear their ugly head. No matter what approaches you take, how are you going to get everybody on your team to understand them deeply, right? Is it pure functional programming? Do you want to be able to adopt a return value of a Kleisley just so that you can do composability of returned futures? Or if you want to be reactive, is everybody going to understand the implications of race conditions and, and, and non-determinism that comes from asynchronous behavior? Probably not. And uh, is, that, is that crazy? I mean, look at just traditional Java developers. I thought I was a decent Java developer for a long time, and I, I really wasn't. It wasn't until I started learning Scala that I started understanding all the things I didn't know, and I started really attacking them. But how many people in the Java community really understand something as deep as Java concurrency library? Right? Anybody? I mean, how many people can tell you the difference between a semaphore and a mutex? Not many. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not unusual to say that nobody understands every part of a language or every part of an approach or every part of a library really well. You might have one or two experts, and believe me, that's one of the reasons why we have Adam and, and we have 47 Degrees helping us out on our team so that we have people around who really understand this stuff and can seed the teams and provide real knowledge and spread that around. But it's going to take time for my developers to understand them deeply. And they're going to learn at a very uneven pace. No matter how many times we have lunch and learns, no matter how many times we try to get together and watch a video together, who knows what. It doesn't matter. Somebody's going to miss it because they're on vacation or whatever or they have a meeting and they can't attend. So there's no way they can all learn at the same pace, at the same time, and understand everything. And that's tough. 
more importantly, I, I actually did something kind of funny, and, and I, I know my team loves me for this. Uh, I, I kind of made them a Petri dish. I actually wanted to see how they learn. And Jason over here is kind of laughing because he was on a very unusual side of it. His team did pure functional programming. They were doing natural transformations. They started writing free monads until I put the kibosh on that. Uh, mainly because of uh, performance concerns, right? I just, I, we didn't know what the performance characteristics of our software was going to be like yet, but first we wanted to get something out there and see how it works. But they're doing all kinds of pure approaches about effect management and understanding when effects take place. Meanwhile, other teams were, you know, taking a more imperative style coding. They didn't have the luxury of having uh, Andy Scott from 47 Degrees working directly with them, so they were learning much more about Akka and understanding those dimensions. And people would come to me and say, we need coding standards. And I said, no, we don't. And everybody said, what? Who says you don't need coding standards? Who would do that? Me. I'm that crazy guy. I actually made a rule that said if you wanted to talk about coding standards, you had to buy donuts and bring them to the office for everybody. Because I didn't want to hear it. I, it meant that my teams wrote different code. The important thing was learning. We're going to be in this code base for five years, at least. It's not like we're going to release this first iteration and then be done with it. So I knew that we were going to have the opportunity to revisit everything that we're doing. As the new requirements of our larger implementation, which is starting, you know, the project is kicking off right now, we have the ability to go back and refactor and revisit what we've done. So I said, let's take advantage of that and kind of force these people to learn individually in the dimensions that help them most the ways they want to learn. And I'm, I've been studying, like watching what it is that each one of them likes so that we can start allowing them to apply that in a specific direction when we start building this new implementation. So that's nutty. We are going to have coding standards. We just didn't want them up front. I didn't want them up front. I didn't want to put a rule in front of everybody that said, this is the only way you're going to do stuff. That wasn't fair to the team. And, so, and they suffered a little bit. But... Uh, <laughs> We're delivering. We've gotten here from a team that had no experience with any of this, and that's, that's pretty amazing to me. So, like I said, Jason's team over there had FP help through Andy Scott in 47 Degrees. It was really uh, amazing to watch them grow and build software. And it, believe it or not, at first they kind of rebelled. They're like, I don't get it. This is ridiculous. Not, not a big fan of this. Don't get it at all. Uh, and we had meetings, and you know, we, we talked about it, and I'd just go, hmm. You know? <laughs> but after a couple of weeks, lights started going off. And you could see the excitement building in the team between him and you know, other people on the team. They started getting more and more excited about what they were doing and what it allowed them to accomplish. And the, you know, the static verifi verification they got of the correctness of their code. And then the level of test coverage they needed as a result of all of the types that they were leveraging was going down. You know, they, they had high levels of test coverage, but they didn't have to write as many of them because the compiler would check other things for them. So that's great. Um, but you know, we had other problems than just having people trying to learn FP. And, a lot of that has to do with, we are also building a platform over AWS. And this platform has limited capabilities because it's being built right now. You can't say you want to use .NET or some totally different platform to run your application. You have to use the JVM. And you know what? You also only get one database, Cassandra. And you also get Kafka and you get a couple other tools like Vault, right? That's great, but if you think about it, the problems we're trying to solve are deeper than that. You can't just say Cassandra is the database for everything. It makes things really difficult. The analogy I've been using is this is like trying to build a car with a wrench, a hammer, and a screwdriver. That's all we get. And we've got to figure out how to apply you know, deterministic behavior, consistent views of data in an eventually consistent store like Cassandra which means we've got to raise it up to the application layer and figure out all those race conditions. Because Cassandra is going to have multi-nodes. And you're going to have something like a write majority quorum kind of setting for it. You're not going to say write to all. That would be very painful on your performance, right? So suddenly somebody doesn't read from one of the nodes that haven't been gossiped to yet, and boom, you're getting invalid state. How are you going to deal with that? Are you going to make reads also a majority quorum? Well, that's also expensive. What prices are you willing to pay when you have a tool chain like that? And then more importantly, we couldn't pull in every library we wanted to. And that meant that we had to do basic 
HTTP RESTful calls between all of our services. And they're all using Okka HTTP, and that's great. It works well, but it's painful. My developers spend a lot of time writing code just to make calls to other services. So that's a good thing. They've learned what this is. They've understood the dynamics of a system built this way. They get what it means now when they understand they're calling out to other services, running on other nodes that have their own SLAs, right? But it's a painful way to go about things. And we, we just had no way around it because of this pass that we're building and the limited capabilities we have. And that's not a knock on the pass. It's just a very hard thing to try and develop the environment you're going to run on at the same time you're developing the software that's going to run on it. So I don't recommend doing that, but that's the reality we faced. So what about ACA clustering? Would that make it easier so we could make message calls, maybe do asks between actors on different nodes and stuff like that? We have avoided that so far, and I think I've said this plenty of times already, but I'm going to say it again. I avoid clustering as hard as I can. I want dumb nodes that don't know anything about any other nodes. And so long as you don't have to think about order, and so long as you don't have to think about grouping, that you know something happened and then you're waiting for something else to happen, then you can get away with this. You can totally just have nodes that you spin up based upon the load you're dealing with, have them work independently. If they fail, hopefully they didn't acknowledge what they were doing and whoever can retry, right? That makes my life a lot easier. We've managed to get by so far without any clustering. The clustering that we do is down at the orchestration level using Kubernetes, and that's fine with me. So I'm going to say flat out right now, that FP knowledge, pure FP knowledge, the deep knowledge you get from somebody like Andy Scott and Adam, does not scale across your entire team. Nobody is going to understand everything about FP. By the same token, neither will Akka, right? Nobody on your team, like, you're not going to have everyone on your team totally understanding this. And when I was writing this, I was actually like, I, I feel really confident about what I'm saying. And then all of a sudden, JetBrains comes out with this, this new survey on Monday that shows 80% of their users are using Akka. I'm like, really? At least the survey respondents. Now, mind you, that's not everybody on your team. Who has everybody on their team using IntelliJ? Everybody on their team using IntelliJ, not using Emacs or Vim or Sublime Text or Atom or whatever it is they like. I mean, any, anybody have IntelliJ entirely on their team? No. No. Well, okay. One person. Two people. That's fine. But it does represent a bias, a selection bias, in that you know, they showed that FP was only down around 15% or something like that. And that's totally not true in the Scala community from my perspective. It's higher than that. It's not 80%, but it is going to be on the order of 25, maybe higher, maybe 33% understand and use pure FP on a regular basis. Cats, you know, maybe they're just using validation, but that is a pure approach. So you're not going to have everybody on your team understand everything about all of these approaches, and that's normal. How are we going to allow our teams to be scaling with these technologies then? Well, remember, it doesn't matter. What matters is I'm delivering business value. And if we spend all of our time sitting there trying to come up with the perfect FP or perfect reactive approach, we're actually losing, right? Does that sound a little crazy to you? That's, that's, that's my contention here. I have to build a reward system. Nobody cares whether I use pure FP. And as a little bit of a story here, I know of a company out there, it's a, it's a young startup, has a very famous pure FP guru working there. I'm not going to name any names here. But they are building this incredible platform for helping, I'm, I'm not going to say what they do, I don't want to out them. But they're, they're building this incredible platform and stuff like that. And they're doing it all using Haskell with pure FP. And I'm sure it's amazing code. But they deployed the system without locking down the ports on their servers. Because nobody thought about security at all. Who would do that, you'd think? Somebody so laser focused on coming up with the best pure FP approach completely forgot that hackers might want to look at the data that they were working on and exposed everything. So, Always keep in mind that the business value has to be the driver. Because if you do something like that, there's no way large companies are going to come up to you and say, I want to use your solution. I don't, yeah, it's Haskell. Woo! 
<laughs> no. <laughs> they want to know that the data that you are going to be holding and stuff like that is going to be appropriately protected. So always think business value first. Now, we've got to somehow make it easier to deliver these kinds of systems. My team has done incredibly well with the limited tools that they've had trying to deliver software. Right? They've done it. We're, we're coming to the end of our, our functional delivery. We're going into our end-to-end -end testing. We've got people in our first market right now verifying. Matter of fact, Chong just flew back from Tokyo where he was doing end-to-end -end testing in market. And it's going really well for us. That's amazing. I'm, I'm so excited about this. But I've got to make it easier on my team. I want reactive principles. I want my systems to be you know, responsive and I want them to be you know, resilient and I want them to be able to scale and be elastic. Those are all very important tenets to me. If they weren't, I wouldn't have been writing reactive design patterns. But how do I make it easy for my team? Using Akka, you feel like you're using primitives, low-level primitives that help you assemble bigger solutions. And that's great. Tools like that are incredibly powerful. But I want my developers to not have to worry about that anymore. Now that they understand it, they're like, fine, that's great. I don't want to have to do this all the time. How are we going to move past? So what I say is let the tool chain handle the majority of the resilience issues. Find the places where business value can be found when you actually have domain-specific behavior around resilience. Find those places. Don't just assume they're everywhere. And don't build them everywhere. And if you ask me, this is actually a very Erlang and Akka-like approach. Erlang and Akka, Erlang being the forerunner and Akka being the copycat, right? I mean, there's, there's no denying that Akka took as many ideas from Erlang as possible because it was such a great idea for building resilient applications. Um, for Erlang, they never put the extra cost in. It's always as low cost as possible, and then you choose where you want your costs to be because of ordering, because of grouping, because of some business rule that says, I need to be able to do X right now. Like, I need to be sure that this thing happens. If I want guarantees, guaranteed processing of some sort of messenger event, I choose when to pay those costs. Well, you know what? Do the same thing in your code. Choose when to pay the costs. So the ways we're looking at this is we're moving toward the Google stack. And some people would say, well, that's not a very Scala-like approach, right? We're going to use gRPC. I spent a very long time at ACA debating, uh, not at ACA, I type safe and light pen, debating the merits of ACA versus RPC, whether it was finagle or gRPC approaches. And I never felt I was wrong, and I still don't. But I don't want to pay the prices of trying to do everything from an ACA-centric approach all the time. When we need to, we will. But as we move into building our new platform for the world, like we just built an MVP, if you will, for one market in Japan. Now we're going to start building out everything for the world. And we're going to do that using gRPC so that my developers don't have to sit down and try and figure out all of the things that they need to do to manage a call to another service. It's going to just be simple for them. But I feel OK about that, because they already understand what it means to make those calls. There was a white paper published in like 1981. I forget the names of the people who were on it. But everybody would bring this up whenever I'd argue RPC versus a more message-centric approach. Um, and it, it made the argument that developers should be disambiguating between a remote and local call. And Akka doesn't really let you do that. Whenever you, it's using location transparency. When you send a message, you don't know whether the other actor is local or remote or whatever. You don't care. You know, either that's configuration driven or cluster driven. Well, in this case, I don't care. You know, I don't care that my developers care about where that is located. I want that location transparency, but I don't want them thinking about what happens when I don't get a response. I want it to feel like a synchronous request response call. I'm going against the grain here. But for the places where I do have to think about guarantees of processing, not delivery, guarantees that something has been processed on the other side, well, I'm going to take a more ACA-centric approach. That's when we're going to overrule and say, 
These are the places where it's adding business value to focus on the guarantees. We're already using Kubernetes. Orchestration to me is as much about the ecosystem around it as it is the capabilities themselves. And when Kubernetes came out, I actually was kind of a, eh, on the fence about it. First of all, I was at Lightbend, and you know, we had our own tool that we were coming up with called Conductor. Um, but it, my primary concern was, well, Google wasn't really using Kubernetes either, so why should we, right? But whenever I'm out there at Starbucks, I can't, I can't adopt a technology and then worry that nobody else is using it. It hasn't been proven at scale, or there's no ecosystem around it helping it grow and guaranteeing its existence for the long term, right? Kubernetes is one of two solutions I see that meet this, the other being uh, Nomad from HashiCorp. So I decided Kubernetes was the way we'd go. Not just me. I'm not the person who makes top-down decisions. I, I let my team actually make these decisions for me. But early on, we had to make some decisions up front, and we did just do a top-down. And then we are going to go with Istio. Has anybody heard of Istio? This is the new service mesh-based platform. It's a control plane, if you will, that encapsulates telemetry and uh, security, like you know, mutual TLS, while bolting a sidecar lift envoy to your, your clusters, if you will, your pods in Kubernetes. And that way, you have the ability to deploy a whole service mesh. Linkerd is also an approach you can use. It is bolting into Istio. And the best part about Istio, from my perspective, is that I don't have to go to my business stakeholders and say, we're going to adopt a technology from a company you've never heard of. It's Google and IBM. You can't make CIOs and CTOs feel more comfortable than saying that you're going to use something from Google and IBM. Right? You walk in and you say you want to use something from flibertygibbet.com, and they're like, oh, no, you know? <laughs> and I don't blame them. There's risk. But when you say IBM, they feel a little more comfy. So Istio, combined with Kubernetes, combined with gRPC calls, are the future of where we're going, and Scala as the language at the endpoints. Because Scala still provides us with the types that we want, and the ability to get correctness out of our code when we statically check. So is Starbucks abandoning Scala and Akka? No. What I feel is we're optimizing for the places where it has the most value. And I think, you know, that doesn't make everybody happy, especially at a conference for Scala up north. But for us, I mean, it's really about rapid delivery. We've got to get our software out as quickly as possible because right now retail's in trouble. Starbucks is doing okay. You look at our comps, you look at our, you know, uh, our, our quarterly reports and stuff like that. We're not doing badly, but a lot of retail companies are. So this is a tough time. A lot of stores are closing around the world. So now what about data? This is an area where things are getting really frisky. How many people are paying attention to what's happening with the cap theorem these days? Turns out, it's not quite what we thought. And the crazy thing about this is, we sit there and we look at the approaches we've taken for the last 10 years, and we've all made the decision that availability is more important than consistency, right? If we wanted consistency, well, we would have stuck with, I don't know, Oracle, right? Um, but we sat there and optimized for the AP side, where we want availability, and yet nobody has come up with a database yet that doesn't have downtime. And maybe that's taking availability a little too far. Availability was never supposed to be that downtime didn't happen. It was just that if a node went down, you weren't hosed, right? But still, we spent all this time optimizing for the AP side at what value? And so a lot of different approaches have been coming down the pike recently that change the way we think about CAP. And it started with Eric Brewer writing a second paper about the CAP theorem, saying it's not quite what we thought. It's more, and I, I, whenever I first read it, I was thinking, okay, yeah, it's more of a sliding scale between consistency and availability. I wasn't grasping what he was saying because I couldn't grok the ideas behind Spanner. And the white paper for Spanner weren't out yet. So I, I, I didn't entirely know what it was they're talking about. But what if you could have a globally distributed, highly consistent database? 
Wouldn't that be awesome? For us, I mean, when we're talking about your rewards points, your stars, I mean, that's not a currency. We can't make it a currency. If we make it a currency, then that is a, a concern from you know, a tax perspective, legality perspective. But we do want a consistent view of your points at any given point in time. And using a database like Cassandra, that's a difficult thing to do. Wouldn't it be great if we could use Spanner? Well, we can't. We're not on the Google Cloud platform. So what are we going to do? Well, we looked at CockroachDB, but that's key value. And Cockroach is also kind of interesting because it's not really using atomic clocks, which is sort of the basis of distributed time disambiguation for the past five years. You know, that vector clocks, you know, um, CRDTs, right? Um, so there is a possibility of latency when using CockroachDB because of just NTP, like time management. Um, but that's okay. If you're not high frequency trading, it's probably not an issue. Yet, the key value semantics really weren't what we were looking for. So we started looking at FaunaDB. Has anybody checked out FaunaDB? Fauna is really interesting. And it's written by Evan Weaver and Attila Segetti, who you may know from Oracle and, you know, Twitter. Um, they are people who've been solving large-scale data problems at Twitter, but in a very, like, ad hoc fashion. Hey, we need a graph database, let's build Flock. Hey, we need another database, let's build X. You know, they just, they always said, what if we could just take all the ideas we have and build the perfect database? And concurrently to this, a fellow at Yale, he may have moved to a different university like Maryland now, his name is Daniel Abadi, uh, came out with this paper called the Calvin Paper. And this is 2011, 2012. Uh, I met Daniel a year ago at a conference in China. And unfortunately for me, I, I totally disagreed with everything he was saying. He was saying that we can have consistent data stores and then all we have to do is take all of these events that are occurring and put them into a distributed log, like Kafka or something like that. And then, you know, disambiguate time in that log, that distributed log, and then push out to nodes. And then on the read side, you know what events occurred and you have a consistent view of data across all of your nodes. So the multi-paxos cost is being paid in that distributed log up front, where Spanner and Cockroach are actually doing it out back at the node level, as to my understanding anyway. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense. What if the, the distributed log goes down? What if nodes are going down all over, the network is partitioning? And what Daniel said was, you're talking about very rare events. I'm like, rare? I worked at Juniper Networks for a year and a half. Are you kidding me? They happen every couple of minutes at the most, right? They're, all, they're happening all the time. I wasn't thinking in terms of how many transactions are occurring and how many of them would fail as a result of a partition. And the percentage is actually low. That's what he meant by rare, but I didn't get it. And so I made a jerk out of myself standing there and saying, hey, that's wrong. <laughs> Where this researcher had some really bright ideas. So then Fauna came along and I saw that they were written in the basis of the Calvin paper and I, I turned a little red and went, oh no. Oh, and I read it, and I was like, now that I understand what he meant by rare, I get it. Daniel was saying not the cap theorem doesn't have implications, but that we're thinking about it the wrong way. And he came up with another acronym that is a little more descriptive. He calls it PAC-ELK, P-A-C-E-L-C. And the idea is that in the face of partitions, I choose availability o over consistency. Else... I'm going to want linearizable consistency across all my nodes. If I don't have a partition, why am I worried about it? When I have a partition, then I worry about it. And that's the basis of Fauna. Optimize more for the 99% case over the 1% of failure. So we're looking very closely at Fauna because now we could have a globally distributed, highly consistent, high transactional database. And it's built in Scala. How crazy is that? You know, it's funny because I, I see people tweeting, Brian McKenna, Tony Morris. I know these people. 
Um, sometimes their rhetoric can be difficult. And I see them say things like Brian a, a month or two ago said, it's impossible to write actual software in Scala. I'm like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't tweet back. I, I wanted to. I'm sure I wrote a couple drafts. You know, but I, I was like, that's absurd. I know plenty of people, myself included, who have delivered lots of applications using Scala. It's just that if you put too much emphasis on one thing, and let's face it, sometimes you're perverting the language in order to accomplish some goals of yours. If you're putting so much emphasis on that, and the language is never intended to do that in the first place, well, yeah, it might not work. But I've listened to Tony talk about how you know, when question mark, question mark, question mark came out, that this is the end of Scala, right? And I was like, all right, let me figure this out a little bit. And I found that whenever I was writing a for yield, they're really great for yields, right? You put the question marks and the yields there, so you don't have type errors on the return value until you figure out what it is you're doing. I love that. And then you look at try. Is try a perfect monad? Does it meet the monad laws? No. Does that mean it's not useful? No, it's still useful. But Tony was like, that's the end of Scala. It's done now. I'm like, ah! You can accomplish amazing things with Scala. It's proven through Fauna. It's proven through Spark, right? Uh, Kafka. You talk to Jay Kreps. You talk to Evan Weaver at Fauna. And they're like, yeah, you know, we, we, we don't focus on that. We just focus on what we have to get done. Business value. What is it they're trying to accomplish? You ask Jay Kreps, hey, is the collections library a problem for you? You know, this can build from nonsense. He's like, no, nah, works great for us. <laughs> right? For the majority of us, it just doesn't matter. If you're writing a really hardcore library to do some amazing stuff for other people, yeah, can build from is probably a real problem for you. But if you're just a developer trying to build a reward system, probably not. So I, you know, I hear these things and I go, ugh. Right? Anyway. So, FaunaDB. Highly recommend you check it out. I'm not getting a kickback or anything like that. Uh, and it, really interesting, uh, Poonam is sitting down there. Uh, she was doing a course at Uni University of Washington on Scala and Akka. There's a whole certificate course down in Seattle. And she did her final presentation on FaunaDB and its implications for how she was able to design software with a consistent database versus using Cassandra. Hopefully she'll do a talk soon about it because I'd love to see it myself. <laughs> anyway, so do we need to be reactive everywhere? Yeah, we need to be reactive everywhere. But we don't have to think about the domain of failure everywhere. Find the places where it has the most value, focus on the business delivery, and you know, build software that works. And that's my talk. So And my daughter is here. Hi, Sophie. <laughs> the other kids were like bored and left. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, does anybody have any questions? I have a few minutes. Yes. Do you uh, do you use Istio in production? Not yet. So the question is, do we use Istio in production? Just in case that's not wired in, um, we are not yet using Istio in production. Um, so right now we are delivering the MVP, and the MVP is that really core set of functionalities on the platform that you know we're building over AWS for the global build that we're putting together, which will be rolled out like next summer for the rewards platform, that you know, will theoretically have Istio in it. Right now, we're still in the early development phase, so we are using gRPC. In testing, we're using Kubernetes, but we're not bolting the sidecar on yet. But we will be, and we're, we're, we are actively interacting with the Istio team from Google and IBM, um, and it is our plan to use it. So the, the telemetry alone, I, I just can't see using Linkerd or Envoy by themselves without this nice extra security and telemetry functionality. Just why wouldn't you? Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jenny, for uh, I like your talk and really appreciate it. I just would like to know if you evaluated the uh, Kubernetes against Mesos where uh, as a cluster manager, a more general cluster manager that is able to handle you know, jobs and microservices and write process at the same time. And I uh, would like to know if, uh, I mean, uh, I heard a lot about Aka, but we use a lot of Aka streams. I would like to hear a few words about it from you. Uh, 
And finally, about coding standards, um, actually we need to code uh, something that aged well. And we need to onboard new programmers with time. And I'm wondering if you use at the same time in your code Scala Z and CAT for validation, or if at the end of the day you standardize some validation and say, okay, we're going for CAT today and leave our old code, by, code base with Scala Z, for example. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, real quickly, I'm going to recap. Uh, Mesos versus Kubernetes, Aka Streams, and then um, coding standards and approaches, Scala Z and CATs in the same code base kind of stuff, right? Um, we did look at Mesos. We had to make a really quick decision because at the point where I joined the project, it was already five months in and had gotten nowhere, in essence. Really, really nowhere. So we had to make some quick decisions. And the problem for us with Mesos was that it was more of a data center solution. It was more of a bigger picture solution than just what we were trying to apply. We wanted a project focused solution, right? So we could do one thing with Kubernetes, another thing with Kubernetes, another thing, whatever, right? And that was the mentality we took. But we didn't have a lot of time. We didn't do a one-to-one -one apples, apples to apples comparison of them with a proof of concept. We just didn't have time. It was a rescue mission at that point. Um, with the second question, this is actually a really interesting one. Aka streams, extremely powerful, useful, but my team, and not just you know, the developers who were new to the technologies and stuff like that, but also the experts that I brought in, looked at this and tried to compose interactions and struggled. And what we found was that for a lot of cases, Monix gave us just as much value with much less complexity. And so for stream handling and a local level, just you know, pipelining stuff through a bunch of sinks, we're using Monix. Aka Streams is more powerful. If we needed to figure out grouped problems and trying to take multiple streams and, and, and um, you know, uh, I forget, the, not conflate, that's the other way, but whatever. Um, you know, try and bring them together and then push them out. Aka Streams is much more powerful. And so we, we, we said, let's use Monix for the majority case. And believe it or not, I, I lost a developer over that. They were like, I thought we were on an Aka project. I'm like, no, we're on a rewards project. <laughs> the developer's like, well, I don't want to be here then. I'm like, all right, well, bye. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I'm just not that dogmatic about it. I need my developers to be able to not have things in their way. And Aka Streams, uh, it's an amazing technology. It really is. For the hardcore stuff, definitely a solution. And it's in our, in our code base, but for the majority stuff, we're just trying to do a real simple little stream handle. It's, it's Monix. And, and you see, like, uh, Yuji Kariki, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this fellow. He's down in Colombia. Uh, we are leveraging a consulting firm down in Colombia called uh, S4N. They're amazing. They're doing incredible work for us. And Yuji is like, I can't believe I didn't use Monix earlier. It's so easy, you know? <laughs> and, and he's already a really hardcore Cats fan and stuff like that. Uh, getting into coding standards. We do have reference architectures. We couldn't do it for this MVP, right? We were too much like, hey, we got to get this started and get going and stuff like that. For the next project we kicked off, the mobile order and pay commerce application, that one does have reference architectures both for stream handling stuff, well, not, event handling out of Kafka and request response synchronous interactions. We have reference architectures for both. Um, and for then the global rewards footprint that we're building, we will also have reference architectures. Right now, we're still in the figure out what it is. What are the things we want to be in there? Um, we're getting close. Scala Z versus CATS, I'll be real with you. I don't want my developers going out and like going on IRC, pound, Scala Z, and meeting the people out there. <laughs> I don't. Not because I don't. The behaviors in that room are self reinforcing, right? And I just don't. Like at Starbucks, we value kindness and empathy. You talk to the people on the Scala Z channel, and they don't. They value, they value rationalism. And I think that's fine so long as you don't be a jerk about it. And what I, what I found is people like Tony, it's not that, I don't think Tony's a bad person. I think Tony tries to help somebody. He gives what sounds like a flip response 
and somebody says, oh, well, if you're going to be a jerk about it, and then Tony loses it. Right? It's not, it's not that Tony's trying to be a jerk. I don't think. I've been watching for a really long time. It's just that he says, dibbledy boop, bibbledy bop, and everybody's like, oh, you're making fun of me. <laughs> you know? He's not. That's just Tony. And then you lose it to him. He loses it to you, and everybody goes nuts. I just don't want my team exposed to that. So we're, we're using cats, and we're not hardcore enough that we've found a real difference. We're using validation. We're using Clisley. We're using a few other, you know, constructs. But for us, cats has been fine. And let's face it, I, I want to be somewhere. I, I watched the whole thing with John DeGoes and the, 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 what was it, the F-COP, the uh, fantasy land code of whatever. Um, and I was like, John just wanted to stir the pot there. Like, I know John. I don't think he's a bad person again, but I've watched the whole LambdaCon thing. I'm like, are you kidding me? Why? Why make things harder in the world by having people be threatened by the people who are attending? Right? Why, why try and throw a bomb into a community that's trying to get away from people being jerks? And that's literally what I felt FCOP was. So, a grenade thrown at cats, trying to find a weakness in their code of conduct. So, you know what, I support cats. I support the idea that people be good to each other. And my developers don't have to deal with jerks, or at least jerky behavior. So, that's a, that, should, that should be some tweets right there that will get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my time is up, but uh, if you want to talk to me, I'll be here all day. So, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, everybody.